Hi, and welcome to the History of Management, our second chapter. Um, well, this uh, gentleman over here that you see, um, uh, maybe you recognize him from the first chapter. Uh, and if you don't, uh, there's a reason he's here. As we start the history of management, we'll see that, you know, it's hard to give anybody, any single person credit for being responsible for management. And the reason that I have him here is because he is the guy who came up with the four functions of management as we know them today. And so let's see if you remember who he is. Uh, moving forward, what we'll do here is uh, we'll cover a lot of grounds in terms of the history of management. We'll look at the origins of uh, management, uh, the history of scientific management. And that's how we're going to start right away uh, in terms of really bringing up speed in the late uh, to early 1900s when it comes to management by looking at scientific management. Uh, then we'll get into the bureaucratic and administrative uh, management uh, and the human relations management. So what you'll see here is you will see a timeline. In fact, two separate timelines that I'll discuss. And one of them is going to be basically a timeline that um, is uh, focused on efficiency. And that timeline will be scientific and bureaucratic uh, management and administrative. And the other one is what we're gonna call the humanistic timeline. That'll be uh, human relations management. We'll look at the history of operations, information system, and contingent management. Uh, and um, let's get started. So management history. Uh, what we have here is, is first, you know, your author, again, I'm following the book, please make sure that you do the same thing. These slides um, really are uh, following the sequence of your chapter. And so uh, the intro that we have here in chapter two is that management is fairly new if you consider that 125 years ago, the field of management per se or the career did not exist. Uh, what we are told and what we discover is that there are uh, seeds, if you will, of management that existed independently prior to, and going pretty far back, by the way. Um, in fact, case in point, uh, the uh, King Khufu uh, pyramid uh, took 23 years, and the author uh, has that as a kind of an opening uh, opening vignette, where uh, he, you know, we learn some really fascinating uh, 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 facts about this. Uh, you know, 2.3 million uh, blocks of stone it, it took, uh, 23 years to complete, 20,000 workers. Um, anyway, you know, the 50 government and uh, religious officials, 200 members of the king's court, 130 stone masons to cut the stones, 5,000 soldiers. Um, anyway, it, it, when you when you really start to look at um, at that. It's clear that uh, the um, you know, management was obviously been practiced, uh, planning, organizing, controlling, perhaps not a lot of leading going on, uh, more uh, of the controlling. Uh, so, you know, just a way for us to kind of delve into the fact that, yes, a bunch of guys, and mostly guys and some ladies, wrote about management theories in the late 18, early 1900. But, you know, there were components, uh, as we call them, these seeds of management prior to. Lots of stuff here as we start to look at the ideas and practices throughout history. I will not ask you to memorize all that. I'll just, you know, you know, you look at Sumerians, 5000 BC with record keeping. We just talked about Egyptians, um, you know, 500 BC, uh, Sun Tzu uh, wrote The Art of War. And that really was a kind of the first... Um, uh, the oldest, I should say, uh, documentation on strategy. Uh, you know, you might be wondering, well, this is about war. What you'll discover in management is that uh, there is a lot that, that management inherits in terms of strategy, uh, management strategy or business strategy that comes from uh, military strategy. Uh, and then moving forward, in fact, all the way down to Machiavelli, uh, you'll hear that name again. It's not a positive thing. Uh, he wrote The Prince, uh, and this is where he talks about cohesiveness, power, and leadership. Uh, being called Machiavellian is uh, not a good thing. We'll learn that later on. Uh, managers today, right? So managers are needed to organize large groups. Uh, you know, when you compare uh, 
what it was like in, in, in the older days. Uh, you know, again, we're talking about uh, leading up to the early 1900s, late 1800s. Uh, you see, you, you know, a, a totally different picture is painted of uh, what um, work was like, right? In fact, uh, seat of the pants management is what it's described as. Uh, managers are needed to work with employees and to make good decisions as well. Um, and so now that's today, let's go back uh, to what leads to management today. How do we get to where we are now? So we are going to start with the first chunk, which is going to be scientific management. And uh, you know, prior to scientific management, if you if you you know when you you, you look at uh, at uh, you know what we have available here in terms of, of, of the slide, like the seat of the pants management, there was no standardization of procedures and no follow up on improvement. Somebody would come in and say, "You do this, you do that, work faster." You know, uh, you're penalized if you don't. You know, there's really no system. Um, and so eventually, scientific management comes in and studies and tests methods to identify the best and most efficient way. So the person who's mostly responsible for this uh, is going to be um, Frederick Winslow Taylor. He is credited as being the father of scientific management. What is scientific management? Thorough study and testing of different work methods to identify the most efficient way to complete a job. I, you know, in class, this is where I would, you know, ask the class if, if we were to go to the local mom and pop coffee shop, let's say for a month every day, you know, let's say we go in at 7.30 a.m., you know, people more likely to stop maybe on the way to work, let's say, and we're going to bring in a, you know, a, a stopwatch and a clipboard and we're going to take some notes and we're going to calculate on average how long it takes uh, for us to get our coffee. We're also, instead of drinking our coffee, we're going to send it to a lab. And then we're going to have the lab test all of these coffees. And we're going to order the same fancy coffee every time. But what they're going to do, what the lab's going to do, is it's going to test the coffee for consistency. So we're going to a scenario A with mom and pop and scenario B with Starbucks and do exactly the same thing. And then the question is, in which of the two scenarios is there going to be an increase in consistency and there's going to be uh, more efficiency in terms of uh, coffee and how long it takes, etc.? And of course, the answer is going to be Starbucks, uh, unless you know an amazing local uh, barista. Um, and the reason it's Starbucks is number one, Starbucks spends you know, millions and millions of dollars on scientific management, even if they don't call it scientific management. And so I just want to kind of give you a modern view of what it is. And, you know, what we learn about scientific management is there is a system for everything. There is an optimal way you study how people make coffee. Uh, and, um, and also we'll learn later on that, of course, uh, making sure that we design a workplace that works best for the employee as well. Uh, and so what Taylor does, he developed time. A study, develop time study to determine what could be considered a fair day's work, uh, timing how long it takes good workers to complete each part of their jobs. That's what he did. Um, now he didn't, you know, again, well, let's just stick to him first. Um, he came up with the principles of scientific management as four principles, right? Uh, the first one was to develop a science for each element of a man's work, which places the old rule of thumb method, or if you will, seat of the pants. Once you've done that, select, train, teach, develop that person, uh, whereas in the past, again, you choose your own work and train yourself the best you can. Third, uh, and again, just look at the wording, heartily cooperate with the man so as to ensure all of the work being done is in accordance with the principles of the science. And then of course, lastly, you know, the last one is very important, almost equal division of the work and responsibility between management and the workmen. Uh, I really hope and I encourage you on page 25, it's 25 through 26 and 27 and uh, 28. Uh, it's probably one of the biggest sections in history of management uh, that you see is on Frederick Taylor. Uh, really important and amazing figure in business. Um, this is not a guy who was born into her position. He worked his way up 
and uh, he faced a lot of challenges. Um, in fact, you you learn some of the terms soldiering, uh, rate busters. Uh, I want you to make sure you, you read that so that um, you understand those terms and can speak to them. Uh, now, what happens is uh, other people become influenced by his work, right? And in this particular case, uh, it's a couple, Frank and Lillian Gilbreth. Uh, they they kind of pick up where he left off. Uh, they, they're married, they're a couple, uh, they, they have 12 kids. Uh, you know, Frank dies sooner than anticipated and, and Lillian gets her PhD and actually uh, does continues the research and publication. And so uh, they employ motion study to, to simplify work and improve productivity. Motion study, you break each task or job into its separate motion and then eliminate those that are unnecessary and repetitive. And the work is really impressive. Um, I invite you to go uh, back, you know, when you're on the Canvas page, I have actually uh, the video, the original video footage of the Gilchrist where they're, uh, they're uh, timing brick layers, for example, and you see a clock running and somebody had to actually crank the camera uh, as best as they could uh, with the clock running and timing those brick layers and then coming up with recommendations to see if they could improve the process. It's really a it's just phenomenal contribution to uh, scientific management. Uh, and then we're getting into uh, Henry Gaunt, who is famous for coming up with a chart. Uh, and as you know, I'm sure a lot of you uh, we will recognize this chart uh, at work. It, it, it prioritizes and optimizes work uh, by indicating which task must be completed at which time in order to complete a project or, or task. Again, seems easy enough, but you know, this is what it looks like in, t in terms of an example from your author on construction, right? Uh, at the top, you interview and select the firm. So you have a specific timeline. If you look at the second uh, of, the, of the row, uh, hold weekly planning meeting with architects. Obviously, you see the second task cannot begin uh, prior to the first task being completed, right? Uh, but what's interesting is that you start to get to an area over here where permits uh, approval uh, are a little bit more fluid. You know, there's a lot of uh, kind of crossover between yet when you can get can get that done uh, compared to the first and second task. Anyway, so it's just a way of uh, you know again trying to plan things accordingly so that you can maximize use of your resources, minimize time, and just optimize the entire output. Uh, let's see. So, um, Max Weber, now we're kicking into bureaucracy. So, we're kind of done now with scientific management, right? So, those three people really kind of fall under the umbrella of scientific management. And now we're getting into bureaucratic and administrative management on page 30 of your book. And so, Max Weber is, a, is the first one we talk about. Uh, he's a sociologist, he's a German sociologist. In fact, uh, he, uh, he is in Munich, uh, München, uh, and if you ever go there, you'll see his name predominant. The, the, the street sign, bottom left of the screen, is uh, the, the plaza named after him in Munich. Uh, there's a subway stop there. Uh, he's, uh, he's, a big, he's a big deal. He's the father of bureaucracy. And so in this case, I know we have a negative uh, kind of uh, attribution to the word bureaucracy. To us, it's red tape, it's slow. But just remember that um, things that back then in the early 1900s were moving a lot slower. And so it made a lot more sense and it worked beautifully well. Uh, today, we have to be flexible and adaptable to change at the speed of light, which is why we tend to think negatively uh, on, on bureaucracy. So it's uh, to exercise the exercise of control on the basis of knowledge, expertise and experience. Again, go back to the era and go back to the beginning of the chap chapter, what he does over here, uh, you know, again, he doesn't invent everything he came up with, but he pulls a lot of resources together and comes up with this concept of bureaucracy where uh, he is able to, again, optimize and maximize and get rid of this whole uh, seat of the pants business that they were using. The aim is to achieve the organization's goal in the most efficient way possible. 
And again, what is efficiency? Efficiency is being able to have the same output, p output possibly with, with less resources and or even less resources and increase the output, right? So what is, when you think about input, uh, what are your resources? Money is a resource, employees are a resource, time is a resource, and that's, that's the goal. Uh, he devised seven elements that characterize bureaucracies. Again, uh, you know, when I see devised, again, he came up with a great list. It's going to be important for you to know that some of these came, you know, they, they were around before, right? Uh, so uh, the first one is qualification-based hiring. One of the things you learned about uh, Max Weber is that, you know, he, he, he lives in an era of nepotism. I know, the shock, the horror. I mean, obviously, that doesn't exist anymore today, right? Uh, and so nepotism, uh, you know, hiring friends, neighbors, uh, somebody that maybe can, a politician, local politician, or family of a local politician, I mean, you name it. Uh, in this case, of course, he's saying, you know, qualification-based hiring is the name of the game. Uh, Merit-based promotion, again, uh, you don't get promoted because you're, you know, know someone, you get promoted based on merit. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, General Electric using the term meritocracy uh, to try to describe uh, the kind of company that they were or they are. The chain of command, I, I'm sure you, you already know what that is, right? Uh, the chain of command, not to be confused, by the way, with division of labor. So let's talk about chain of command. Uh, the term that, that you'll hear in management books in the future, I think it'll pop up here actually, is going to be a scalar principle. Think of scales. The chain of command means uh, you report to your boss. If you have a problem, you go to your boss, but you don't skip rank. You don't go to your boss's boss. You respect the chain of command. Division of labor is a uh, different. Uh, you know, this is when you're talking about the accountants are in the accounting department, the finance people in the finance department. Uh, you're dividing labor equally. Uh, division of labor really is a very, very big deal. In, you know, prior to. Uh, him coming up with this list here. Uh, the author, in this case, I didn't find it in, the, in this chapter, but one of the person who has, uh, in fact, chapter one of his book about division of labor is Adam Smith, the uh, father of you know capitalism, if you will, uh, father of economics. Uh, Adam Smith's book, uh, you know, uh, The Wealth of Nations, chapter one of the book is entirely dedicated to a pin manufacturing which is entirely uh, uh, proving the point that division of labor uh, makes things more efficient. Uh, the impartial application of rules and procedures. Again, everybody gets treated the same, right? And of course, everything should be recorded in writing. Uh, this is a big deal. You might think like, well, who cares? Think about policy change, right? How many times at your work, maybe your boss, somebody said, you know, we're gonna you know, try to come up with some new policy and I don't know, two years down the line, people don't remember why they changed, right? There's, a, there's an old joke about uh, these, uh, these uh, three women at a wedding, right? And so the bride is, uh, you know, there, she's having the big lunch and she's sitting next uh, to her mother and the mother is sitting next to her mother. So the bride, the mother and the grandmother. And the bride uh, talks to the mom and says, hey, by the way, my, my friend was asking me about the ham recipe you gave me when I, you taught me when I was a kid. She says, well, what about it? She says, you always taught me how important it was to cut the edges off the ham. And the mother says, oh, yeah, sure. It's very, very important. We have to cut the edges off the ham. So the daughter says, why is it so important? She says, that's just the way it is. It's just important. It's part of the recipe. But she says, well, let me ask grandma. Maybe she'll know something I don't. So they turn to grandma and they ask, okay, when you taught me, the mother of the bride, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, cut the edges of the ham for the, for the recipe, was there a purpose? And the grandma says, yes, we were poor. The pan that we had was too small. We always had to cut, just, cut, cut the edges of the ham so it could fit in the pan. You'll hear the story again. It's very popular in business circles. But the, the story basically is, is, has several uh, purpose. Uh, first, if you don't record things in writing, you can't just go back and find out why you made the change. And if you don't know why you made the change, you're stuck with something stupid. Uh, and so that's the first thing. 
And the second thing is, of course, the purpose of the story is to, you should always question, why are we doing it that way? Uh, managers are separate from, from owners. That's a big one, right? It's a really, really very important one because uh, what it might mean is that, yeah, you know, congratulations, you were really good at, you know, creating this invention, starting the company, whatever, whatever, but maybe you're not the best person to run this place. Maybe that's something else somebody should do. Um, and so that's, you know, get, you know, I'm giving you kind of a, the essence of that. Well, there he is. I uh, gave you the picture at the beginning of the lecture, Henry Fail. I always joke that if you can't remember his name, you will fail. Uh, you know, French mining engineer uh, came up with the, you know, in the old days, the five functions of management. If you go back to chapter one, uh, we, of course, modified them to the four functions of management. I hope by now you know what they are. Plan, organize, lead, control. And he also came up with the principles of management, division of work, authority, responsibility. I'm not going to ask you to memorize all of them, but what's important here is that you will recognize uh, some of the similarities uh, that you see uh, with the previous slide. Uh, some of them are, are different. So for example, uh, so division of work, we did that. Authority, responsibility, okay, that's a new one. To be disciplined, find. Unity of command, uh, that, that's a new one here. It's a very important one. Unity of command means that uh, you report to one person and that the, uh, the um, uh, decisions uh, are all aligned with the objective of the company. And so in this particular case, if you think about unity of command, um, maybe some of you have worked in an environment where you reported to two managers. Maybe you had two bosses. And if you think back about how that worked, uh, most of the time when I ask my students, it's not very good. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it convolutes things. Uh, there's uh, disagreements maybe between the two bosses about what they want you to do with your time. And so they're violating a basic command of Henry Fail. And that command is, I mean, that rule is the unity of command. You should report to one person, not two. Later on, we're going to come, you know, learn about a system or structure called the matrix structure, and we'll see that there are exceptions to unity of command where it's okay to break, but there there has to be a reason. Unity of direction. Again, everybody's aligned to north. If you close your eyes right now and you point north, right, or you can keep your eyes open, and then double check later on if you were really pointing north, right. It's easier to do this in class. When I do this in class and I ask 50 students to point north and close their eyes and then keep pointing but open their eyes, it's, it's interesting to see how many people truly are pointing north. So let's say, you know, two-thirds of the class point north. Well, in this case, we could say that one-third of the class is not pointing the right way. And as a class, if we were all working for the same company, uh, we need to work on unity of direction because one-third is not pointing the right way. Uh, subordination of individual interest to, to general interest, again, what that means is that you, know, you are here not because you're doing the thing that's your job for your own benefit, but for the benefit of the company. Uh, we'll learn later on about silos, for example, some big organizations, and uh, the individual interest or even the interest of the division uh, is at the cost of that of the company. Remuneration is a fancy word for pay. That's it. Uh, you know, if you want one day to somebody or a job interview is asking if you have any questions about remuneration, you better say yes. Centralization, uh, it, control comes from this one centralized area that's usually the top of the company. Earlier, uh, skiller chain, the skiller principle I just talked about. Uh, order, equity, there has to be equity. Everybody gets treated the same. Uh, stability of tenure personnel. This is what later on we call the social contract, that you know, you've been with the company 25 years. I'm not going to let you go after 25 years and that uh, you, know, you, you, you belong there. Of course, initiative and esprit de corps. Esprit de corps is a French word that basically means like you know, team spirit, if you will. Um, all right, moving along. Uh, what I did here, this is not in your book, but I, I, I think a lot of you are visual and I'm a very visual person. So I created this timeline to kind of help you out. I call this timeline the efficiency timeline, and it's split into these two parts, scientific management and bureaucratic and administrative management. 
you've got three people under scientific management, Taylor, Gilbreth, Gaunt. And then under bureaucratic administrative, we're going to stick to Weber or Weber and fail. The dates are an approximate. Um, you know, for example, Gilbreth and Gaunt this crossover. So we put 1910. Some of the publications are in, in 1911. Uh, Winslow Taylor, same thing. I'm just going by some of the big publications, but 1880 seems to be like the crux of the scientific management, like the birth of it per se. Um, and then uh, Weber and Fayol, interestingly, uh, their publications are almost fall in the same year, 1916. Now, uh, to the right of the arrow of the timeline, you see all these dots. What it means is that this thing doesn't end, you know, when Fayol stops. We're still improving upon uh, you know, efficiency and scientific management and uh, bureaucratic mystery is still very much alive and lots of work being done there. So now let's begin the next phase uh, once we finish the efficiency timeline, which is going to be uh, the humanistic approach. Um, the pioneer here the, is uh, Follett, Mary Parker Follett. Uh, her focus on people and saw them as valuable organization or organizational resources in their own rights, uh, constructive conflict and coordination. Uh, parties in a conflict should engage in integrative conflict resolution instead of dominating the other party. Um, and uh, she was a big fan of compromising. Uh, one of the things about, uh, about her also, it was integrative conflict resolution. Both parties indicate their preference and work together to find an alternative that meets both their needs, uh, coordination and control should be based on facts and information. Again, uh, she really uh, moved things forward. And if you think about what we just did with the previous uh, timeline on efficiency, yes, there was effort by some people when you look at uh, Fail and the Gilbreth um, that they did put into consideration uh, the employees and, uh, you know, Taylor. Taylor put a lot of effort, put a lot of emphasis in treating the employees well, giving them breaks, etc. In fact, uh, your textbook has a little area specifically about sleep during work, taking a little 30-minute uh, uh, power nap. And so that, that really flows from Taylor. Uh, what she does here with the human relations uh, management uh, for her section is she really takes it to the next level. Uh, after that, what we have here is um, Elton Mayo. Um, and what he does was also really interesting. What, what's fascinating about his study, so this is called the Hawthorne study, or the Hawthorne you know, experiment. Uh, what's interesting about him is, is what, you, what you'll learn is that he came into the experiment kind of late in the game. Uh, and so, you know, by the time he came in, uh, the experiment started in 1924. He came in in 1928. And when you, when you read the experiment that was going on uh, in this relay room, uh, it sounded like it, it was an efficiency study, right? From the very beginning, uh, they were trying to look at efficiency. So if you look at the previous timeline, the impetus of this experiment was, was evidently uh, efficiency. But what happens here was, was phenomenal. That picture that you see here on the screen uh, is, is actually a, an authentic uh, a picture of uh, the uh, relay assembly room in 1930. And uh, what, what happens here is that uh, these women are actually pulled away from the other lines. And so the other workers are doing their regular thing and then these six women, uh, their, their opinions asked, they have meetings uh, with the team prior to why they do things a certain way, would this, would that change, et cetera, et cetera. And then they experimented with dif different things, time, lighting, the, the, very, the very famous one was the lights. They decided they wanted to see if they work better with more lights or with less lights or with the same lights. And then they, they were perplexed when they discovered that the team of six women uh, was outperforming, outproducing the rest of the workers on every basis. And it didn't seem to make sense until they discovered that it was because uh, they were asking for their opinion. They were being involved. Their opinion mattered. 
And so, um, you know, the study helped understand the effect of a group social interactions, employee satisfaction and attitude on individual and group performance. And then after this, we're getting into uh, Chester Barnard. Uh, he proposed a comprehensive theory of cooperation in formal organizations. He defined organizations as a system of consciously coordinated activities or forces created by two or more people. Uh, importantly, he stated that the willingness of employees to cooperate depends on their perception and acceptance of executive authority. And so, you know, this is again, uh, if, you, if you think back about, again, the, the uh, social contract and if you think about the idea that uh, you, uh, you involve people and you get legitimacy as a leader and uh, they'll, they'll, they'll perform better. Uh, the quote here from him was, to try and fail is at least to learn. To fail to try is to suffer the inestimable loss that of what might have been. Uh, the timeline here for the humanistic, uh, you know, timeline is, is uh, definitely shorter. I didn't, you know, put any dates here, uh, but just kind of, again, you see those dots at the end. It never ends. It keeps going. Uh, now that we have passed the uh, section here on the history of management in terms of the fathers and the mothers, we're getting into operations management. Uh, this is a really critical aspect for you, uh, especially for you because you are uh, you live in the Inland Empire. Uh, one out of every four jobs in the Inland Empire is you know logistics, distribution, etc. Uh, and so operations, if you're interested in operations, you're in the right place. Um, operations management, they use uh, quantitative methods to find ways to increase productivity and improve productivity and manage or reduce costly inventories. Uh, I'm giving you an example here of um, you know, Amazon. Uh, we have several factories here of Amazon in the Inland Empire. So let me, uh, let me show you this little clip here. On the ranking of things to worry about, Skynet coming and taking over doesn't even rank in the top 10. It distracts attention from the more urgent things, like for example, what's going to happen to jobs. For a glimpse into the future, consider one of the largest companies on the planet, Amazon. Amazon has tremendous scale. We have fulfillment centers that are as large as 1.25 million square feet. That's like 23 football fields. And in it, we'll have just millions of products. To deal with that scale, Amazon has built an army of robots like a marching army of ants that can constantly change its goals based on the situation at hand, right? So our robotics are very adaptive and reactive in order to extend human capability to allow for more efficiencies within our own buildings. As you transfer to a four year after you're done with JV College, uh, you, you will be required to take an operations management class and you'll get a lot out of it. Quality control, forecasting techniques, capacity planning are uh, several uh, issues, functions that, that you will you will learn about under operations management, productivity measurement and improvement, uh, linear programming, and by the way, there'll be a whole chapter on that just in this book. So I'm going to move ahead. In fact, unfortunately, it's a very last chapter. I say unfortunately because um, I, my favorite part of the operations is a quality aspect, and uh, I'll spend a little bit of time on that at the end. Uh, work measurement techniques and project management, uh, your cost benefit analysis, a lot of things that you, I mean, you, you even inertly already know, uh, innately, sorry, uh, know. Uh, for example, the uh, cost benefit. You know, um, things are different now because, of course, this class uh, is asynchronous, so you can watch this video on your own time. But let's go back to, you know, the pre pandemic era when you did have to make a choice when you wanted to take classes and let's say you packed all your classes on monday wednesday so you drive to chafee and you start your class at 8 a.m and you take a couple classes before lunch and maybe after lunch you have another class and uh, there's your three you, your three classes there uh, but you have to take time away from work which means that you have to make a decision about uh, less revenue less income and so the cost benefit is just that you've decided that you've made a calculation that you are willing to forego in this case the uh, 
immediate uh, uh, reward of getting paid now because you calculated that getting your degree uh, will be more worthwhile in the future uh, as, uh, as, as you, you know, get after your bachelor's degree, you get a better job. Uh, the systems view of organization, this is really great. So uh, what we have here is, first of all, this is a closed loop, right? It's a closed loop. So what you have here is you, you see things moving throughout and then out and about and then just uh, right back in, right? And uh, you have the internal environment and the, the external environment. So, so first let's go with the internal. You're getting your inputs from your general and specific environment. What is that? Well, first let's go with specific. The specific environment, if you want, let's call it the micro environment, and the general would be more the macro environment. So your suppliers, your competitors, your customers, advocacy group, and industry regulators are all going to be part of your specific environment, and they're they're going to have an effect on your uh, your choices in in, to, in terms of how you manage, how you manufacture, what you manufacture, what the techniques are. All of these inputs are going to affect that. Same with the general, which is more macro environment, the economy, uh, any new technology, politics, sociocultural, it's missing a couple, global, etc. And uh, same thing. So you are going to get that input, you're going to convert it into output, which could be a product and service, and you will get feedback from that output through that loop that comes back in. Again, this is a closed loop. Um, it never it never changes. It just always adapts and improves. Uh, let's see. The contingency management holds that. Now, now we're skipping uh, to the next level, which is contingency. Uh, there's no universal management theories and that basically effectiveness of a management depends on the kinds of issues you're facing at a particular time and place. Case in point, look at what's happening right now. Think about how many businesses could have forecasted what's happening and how they were, you know, how they planned for it or what they were able to do to try to not just survive but hopefully even thrive if that's even possible. Look at the restaurants, look at, you know, uh, healthcare, uh, how hospitals and had to kind of completely change the way they were operating to provide a safe environment, relatively safe uh, for their patients, uh, so that the COVID is done away from the hospital, the COVID testing, etc., cetera, uh, and uh, the hospital is still open for things that people do, break bones, whatever. Uh, it has practical implication, which is that management cannot quickly solve a company's problem by taking a few steps and that managers must pay attention to key contingencies that differentiate uh, situations and problems. Um, to conclude on this, the, the contingency, I, I always like to talk about Ken Chenault. He really was uh, an amazing CEO. He retired or recently, uh, I guess his retirement, he, he even uh, when he retired, he was a, you know, the CEO of American Express. And when he retired, he was such a beloved uh, and respected CEO that um, he had a, like a meet and greet with employees in New York. And the poor guy was stuck there for, for the majority of the day because people were flying in to, to meet their now retiring uh, CEO. Um, he, he, made, uh, he, he really made history at American Express. Um, prior to September 11th, he was a chief operating officer of American Express. And a lot of people don't realize American Express had a big presence in the Twin Towers. Uh, he understood that, you know, it's always good to have contingency uh, plans. And he had convinced uh, American Express to come up with a lot of contingencies operationally so that um, there would be backups, etc. You know, because the Twin Towers were old buildings and just good practice, good business. Um, after, of course, uh, the catastrophe of September 11th, uh, when people realized uh, how he had really, some people say, saved American Express there, uh, he was promptly uh, promoted to CEO of American Express and uh, since then really t just completely turned the company around and uh, uh, made it uh, into the successful company that it is today. So he, he's a highlight, uh, an amazing highlight uh, as a former CEO 
who is now CEO and uh, really um, understood this contingency manager uh, better than most. And that concludes this chapter uh, in 40 minutes. Uh, so please, again, make sure you read ahead and uh, get ahead of uh, chapter three before we get there, Organizational Environment and Culture. It's a fun chapter. It's a very important chapter. Uh, I promise it'll be exciting. I'll, I'll bring some interesting stuff uh, from different companies that I know will, will pique your interest. Until then, 